Uh, so, so I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. This is our second series of Small Credit Union um, training or learning uh, for introducing new vendors. And we are doing this in conjunction with the Association of Vermont Credit Unions. Uh, I wanna thank my colleague, uh, Christine Davidson, uh, for helping coordinate this uh, with the different vendors, as well as um, the timing and helping schedule everything out. Uh, so today we have two speakers. We have Joe from Blue U Defense, uh, who we, I will introduce in a moment. And then we have Diane Gagney from New England Money Handlers. Um, First up is uh, Joel Hyman. He's a co-founder and training specialist for Blue U Defense. He has served as the assistant team commander for the Monadnock Regional Special Response SWAT team in for 19 years as a detective with the Jaffrey, New Hampshire Police Department. Prior to his career in law enforcement, he served as a security supervisor at a corporate management level of a Fortune 500 company. Joel holds two AA degrees in criminal justice, law enforcement, in criminal justice corrections, probations, and parole, and has extensive tactical training. Uh, and he's gonna talk about drugs in the workplace and on money today. So Joe, the floor is yours, take it away. Awesome, thanks Dean, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you all taking the uh, uh, half hour or so here to join me on, on my portion of this presentation. Um, I'm gonna give you kind of a high level view um, of what some of these things look like um, and some of the problems that we're facing um, in not only the, the credit union financial work, you know, industry, but um, realistically, whether it be at home or a workplace, it really doesn't matter. We're dealing with this major drug epidemic uh, throughout the nation. So again, it's going to be a high level view. This is a longer program, but just to give you some things to think about, maybe take back to your employees. Um, and again, just some considerations. So you see my opening slide there. Um, I've got a, a folded dollar bill in the right corner uh, of the screen. And one of the things that we're seeing is that uh, sometimes traps are being laid where somebody will take some money, uh, fold it up, drop it in the corner of a parking lot or near a car, or put it under a windshield wiper. I won't have time to get into a lot of detail today about those things, but uh, some of the things that we are seeing are a lot of these drugs are transdermal, which basically means that you ingest them the moment that you're touching them. Uh, so again, primarily, I'm going to focus on our opioids and opiates today, um, and then I'll end with methamphetamine. Um, if I have enough time for it, I will end with methamphetamine. So I'm going to get right into it. Dean gave an overview of who I am. I was a police officer for 20 years. Um, I did work on a cover. Uh, the thing with the drug world is uh, a lot of times people will ask me, you know, how did I gain my experience in the drug world? And the reality of it is I learned directly from the people that I arrested. So I was curious, how do they get through a day of work? How did they become addicted? What is their drug of choice? How are they ingesting it? And ultimately, what is the impact that it's having on their body? So a lot of the things that you're going to see today are going to come directly from the people that I talk to. You're also going to hear me use terms like drug addict. The reality of it is I know the proper term is people who suffer from substance abuse. However, that's a long, cumbersome term. And the fact of the matter is, is that they call themselves drug addicts. So if I use the term drug addict, it is not intended to be offensive in any manner. It's just easier to say. And again, the reality of it is that's what they call themselves. So we'll get right into this. What is my passion? My passion as a company is to keep people, families, businesses, employees safe from today's ever-changing threats. And one of the biggest threats that our employees face, our families face today, if you see my workplace violence training classes, we talk a lot about that, but one of the bigger challenges that we're facing is this drugs and the drug epidemic. And if you've got kids that are in school, I promise you this, and I have kids that are in school. My son is 17, my daughter is 15. And I was, as I was going through this presentation, putting some of it together last night, I was doing it with my son. And he's like, Dad, I've seen that. Uh, in the bathroom, they were smoking BHO um, in the bathroom at my local high school. So we're going to talk about a couple of those things today. BHO is butane honey oil. These are things that your kids have already been exposed to. And I promise you this, I don't care how big my audience is. I was in Indianapolis teaching a class with 550 people in the auditorium. And I don't care how big or how small my audience is. I can look out there and I can say every single person that's on this webinar today or was in my audience in Indianapolis knows somebody who has a drug problem. I don't care how good a family you are, how much money you have, how religious you are, whether they're involved in sports, Every single one of you knows somebody who has a drug problem. That's how large this problem is. Now, you may not realize it, and it may be legal prescription drugs, but every one of you knows somebody who has a drug problem, and that means it's in our workplace. And if we have substance abuse in our workplace, we also have dealing in our workplace. So we need to understand what these things look like, and I'll get right into it here. 
So I'm going to start off with this slide. Again, I use the term addicts, but people who suffer from drug addiction, these are good people with a horrible problem, perhaps a problem that none of us could ever understand but it makes it this much more apt for us to become a victim of a violent encounter than perhaps ever before. And oftentimes people will say, well, if they overdose, they did it to themselves. They're a waste of air. They're, they're their own worst enemy. Well, that's really easy for you to say until it's your son, until it's your daughter, until it's somebody that you love. So I'm going to start with, again, the foundation being people who suffer from drug addiction. These are good people with a horrible problem. And we've got to rethink the way that we think about these people and even the conversations that we're having with employees in the workplace, whether we activate our EAPs or whether we terminate that employee and the help that we get them. I, again, I won't have time to get into a lot of that. So we're going to talk specifically about drugs today. Now, an interesting statistic for you and the FBI and DEA work hand in hand compiling stats. 80% of people who suffer from drug addiction are employed. So oftentimes people have this ideology that the drug addict, the heroin addict, the fentanyl addict, the meth addict, crack addict, whatever it happened to be, they're the homeless guy living underneath the bridge in the cardboard box in a trench coat. Well, that may be true, but the reality of it is, is that 80% of people who suffer from drug addiction are employed. So how are they getting through a day of work? What does a peak high look like? What does withdrawal look like? Where are they using and what are the drugs that they're using to get through their day of work? And it's critical that we understand that. Now, a little bit more about stats. And I know that I've got uh, several states that are on here, but I put in New Hampshire. New Hampshire is the worst state in the entire country per capita when it comes to drugs and drug overdose deaths. And I'm going to put it in perspective. There were 417 drug overdose deaths in 2020. The majority of the overdose deaths are due to synthetic opioids, which is fentanyl. The difference between an opiate and an opioid, opioid is going to be or opiate is going to be your heroin that's coming primarily from Mexico. And our opioids being fentanyl and carfentanyl are coming from China. At least the precursors are coming from China, and then it's funneling back through Mexico into the United States. But that's where most of our drug overdoses, especially in the Northeast, are coming from, is opiates and opioids. This was an interesting stat when I started compiling these, is the largest group of overdose deaths is 30 to 39. So oftentimes people think, well, it's the younger kids that are dying. And they are. There's a lot of young kids that are perishing as a result of substance abuse. But the largest age group is 30 to 39 years old. So most of these people are entrenched in our workplace. They've worked there for a decade and they're suffering from substance abuse. No surprise here. Manchester has the largest amount of uh, drug overdose deaths in the, in the U.S., but people oftentimes ask, how did we get here? Why, why do we have such a major problem? Here's why. In 2008 to 2012, rough numbers, doctors across the nation were pumping out uh, prescriptions for opiates uh, and opi actually opioids. And in New Hampshire, doctors wrote 72 pain pillar prescriptions for every 100 people in the state. So when you think about it from that perspective, so many people are becoming addicted to these opiates and opioids as a result of a prescription that they were prescribed from their doctor. And it started something in them that they never knew existed before. So if you've ever been prescribed a prescription for, let's call it Perc 30, Percocets, Percocet 30s, right? Or Oxy 30s. You walk over to that prescription bottle at day 27, day 28, day 29, somewhere in there. And you pick up that prescription bottle and you say to yourself, dang, I have two left. That is the start of an addiction. Now, for many of us, we take them as prescribed, we throw the bottle away and we're good to go. We just continue on with our lives. But for so many more people that started an addiction in them that they had no idea even existed. And now they're looking to refill that prescription. Then the doctors won't refill it and they're turning to the streets. What I was paying, and again, I worked on the cover, what I was paying for prescription opioids on the street was about a dollar a milligram. So if I'm buying an Oxy-80 on the street and I'm buying six or eight Oxy-80s a day and I'm spending $640 a day in Oxys, that's a really expensive addiction. One that many of us on this call today can't afford, 600 and something dollars a day in a prescription pill habit. So the natural progression is a six or a $7 stamp of heroin or fentanyl. It gives you a better and a longer lasting high. And again, that's the natural progression. So that's kind of how we got there. And I'll get more into detail about these things. So heroin has an average high, depending on how long you've been using, how much you're using, an average high of three to five hours. And this is gonna be true for your fentanyl and carfentanil as well. Any opiate or opioid, it's gonna be about three to five hours. So if you think about it from this perspective, how long is your average workday? 
Well, most of us would say our average workday is around eight hours. Now, if you're a manager, maybe it's 12, right? But the majority of people, it's around eight hours. So what does that mean? At some point, when one of your employees comes to work, they're going to be at their peak high. And then they're going to start to withdraw. And then they're going to be back at their peak high. Throughout the day, you're going to see these things. So if we don't know what they look like, then we're missing the signs. We're missing building that reasonable suspicion. If anybody has a policy on that for how you confront an employee and then what you do with that confrontation. So the average high, again, three to five hours. So when somebody is at their peak high on an opiate or an opioid, they're going to go into a state that's called on the nod. And basically what it is, is their body uh, physically is shutting down. So when your heart lowers to 30 beats a minute, everything gets smaller and you start to almost like you're falling asleep. And I'll, I'll show you how this works, but your body starts to get smaller. We've all heard of the fetal position, right? So that's basically what your body is doing because your heart rate is getting so lower. Everything is getting smaller and you're, you're constricting inside of your body. I'm going to show you a couple of videos here and then I'm going to explain why these are important. So this is a subway worker making a sandwich who's on the nod. Play another video here. This video here, before I push play on this, if you were to confront an employee and you saw them kind of slunched over in their seat or slowly going down in their seat, working at their computer or working at their workstation, wherever it is, maybe back office staff, and you ask them, what's wrong? What's going on? What do you think they're going to tell you? Well, again, this is virtual. So most people are going to say, oh, I'm just tired. I was falling asleep. I was up all night. I didn't sleep while the baby kept me up. And you're like, you don't even have a baby, right? But you know, that's typically how they're going to explain it away is that I'm just falling asleep. But I want to put it in perspective. Let's just say that you're in your office. You're, and you're starting to no, uh, nod off because you're actually tired, right? And your manager walks into that office and they're like, hey, Joe. If they do that, what's your reaction going to be if you're falling asleep? Most of us would say we we're going to startle awake. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I, I, I fell asleep. I apologize. Right. I mean, it, that's the natural reaction if you're falling asleep. But if you're on the nod, this is a physical reaction that your body's having, not a mental reaction. So when you're on the nod, as opposed to falling asleep mentally you can hear what's going on you're you're somewhat aware of what's going on around you and instead of being startled awake you can just answer the question so i would have people in my booking room and they'd be nodding off and i would say what's your date of birth and immediately they could answer the question 10 10 82 they could tell me their birthday just like that even though it appeared as though they were falling asleep so a big difference between falling asleep and on the nod and i'm going to put it in i'm going to show you this video here and we're going to i'll explain it do you see her nodding off Okay. All right. So again, had she been falling asleep, you know, and again, I know that that's a pretty obvious video. We know something's wrong there. Um, but had she been falling asleep and somebody banged on that table and said, get up again, the reaction would be, oh my gosh, I can't believe I fell asleep. But she didn't. She knew exactly what was going on. She banged back on the table and she's like, okay, that's the difference between falling asleep and on the nod. And on the nod is the peak high that somebody's going to be at. So let's talk a little bit about paraphernalia and things that you might be seeing inside the workplace. Small pieces of cotton, Q-tips. I was down in Atlanta the other day and I was doing a uh, security assessment at an apartment complex and there's Q-tips all over the parking lot in the apartment complex. And the guy said to me, he's like, what is the deal with the Q-tips? And I'm like, the people in Atlanta are not walking around cleaning their ears all day because they're like, we got to have clean ears, right? Those are, that is drug paraphernalia. They're using the cotton swabs and I'll show you this here in a minute but they're using the cotton swabs to pull their product into their syringes, hypodermic needles. Most often when you deal with somebody that's diabetic, 
They're not taking their insulin and then taking their needle and launching it out into the parking lot. They're usually better about discarding of their needles. Bottle caps with liquid or soaked cotton in it. Again, these things are transdermal. We need to understand what these things look like. Razor blades, tiny plastic baggies. If somebody's, if you're finding little pieces of plastic baggie, torn off pieces of plastic baggie in your building, nobody is packaging one pretzel for a snack and bringing it to lunch. Those are, that is drug paraphernalia. The cellophane from a cigarette carton oftentimes is where they will hide or put some of their product. Uh, spoons with residue. If people are heating up their spoons, nobody's eating their yogurt in their car thinking my spoon's just a little bit too cold. Let me warm it up. If you're finding burnt spoons, that is all residue. Pipes, grinder, scales, rolling papers. Some of these are relatively obvious. So let's talk about some of the drugs that we're seeing. Again, I know that I'm going quick, but I've got a very short period of time. So some common drugs that we are seeing. And again, if you've got kids in school, I promise you, they've already seen these things inside of your school. Any ADHD medication, any sleep aid, any anti-anxiety, any pain meds, cough syrup, inhalants, these are heavily abused products all over, especially in the Northeast here. Anti-anxiety, anti especially when we're in school or if I'm in colleges, uh, you see this term here, clonopins. So K-pins were, we called them K-pins. K-pins were something that I used to buy on the street by the dozen. So I'd pay about $2.50 for one, or I could get two for $4, or I could buy a pack of them for 20 So these are ones that were handed out in colleges, especially, hey, you're about to take that major exam. Just take this pill. In kids' mind, who makes pills? Doctors make pills. Now, we know it's a pharmaceutical company, but in their mind, it's okay to take pills because it's prescribed by a doctor and from a pharmacy and it's safe to take. But most of our fentanyl, and I say most, most of our fentanyl that's coming in from, um, from Mexico primarily right now, it's being stamped out into pills. So you're taking a pill that you think is a K-pin or Lexapro or a Valium, and it's pure fentanyl, and kids are overdosing and they're dying just that quickly. So make sure that, again, your kids and your employees know that just because it's a pill does not necessarily mean that it's actually the pill that it's stamped out to be. So heroin and opiates. Again, heroin is going to be a natural substance. It is an opiate. So if you look at the top left picture, I've got brown here. So this brown photo here, that's heroin. Now, right next to it is a white powder. Typically, when I would buy it on the street, if it was white, we used to call it China white. China white is primarily going to be laced with fentanyl. So it changes from brown being heroin, white being fentanyl. Not always. Sometimes brown will be pure fentanyl. Again, they're dyeing it and they're making different colors. They're stamping out purple pills and all that. But most often, um, when it's white, it's going to include some sort of fentanyl. A lot of people think that it's cocaine. We do see cocaine here in the Northeast, but for the most part, we're really dealing with a lot more fentanyl and car fentanyl. So right next to that picture, you see a standard rig box, what I would call it. So you see the burnt spoon here. You see all the substance on it, this small piece of cotton in the center here. That's a burnt piece of cotton that they use to pull their product into their syringe. Again, all this is transdermal. All of this will test positive for the drug that they ingested. Now, I'm going to show you a quick video here of somebody that is uh, preparing their product for injection. I won't show you him inject it, but I just want you to watch for how this works so you understand the process. It looks like he's putting China white or something, maybe some fentanyl into that bottle cap, and you'll see how he does it. It's different for every kind of pill or every kind of drug. So he's going to heat it up and he's going to stir it. You're heating it up so that the product will actually um, uh, mix up into the water and prepare for injection. All right, so then he drops his cotton swab in there and he's going to pull it in prepared for injection. Now, people oftentimes ask me, why are they using cotton swabs to pull their product in? There's two primary reasons. Number one, they want to filter out the impurities. And number two, they want to make sure they don't get air in the line. So if I pull an air bubble into my syringe and I inject that into my vein, it's going to give me a pulmonary embolism and it's going to kill me. So they're trying to make sure that, again, they don't have um, any impurities in there as well as uh, the air in the line. So now... This next statement, I'm not going to imply that somebody that smokes cigarettes is going to use heroin. However, I've never found anybody that uses heroin that doesn't also smoke cigarettes. Again, I'm not implying one for the other, but here's where I'm going with that. If somebody smokes a cigarette at their lunch break and then they take their filter, they save the filter and they unwrap the paper off of their filter to keep the cotton filter. If there are the fiberglass that's in the, that cotton filter. 
oftentimes they take that filter and they stick it onto the end of their syringe. And that's what they're using to pull their product into. So again, those are help, things to help you build that reasonable suspicion. So we talked about heroin, but primarily towards the latter part of my career, when I would get, I get called to all drug overdose deaths. So when I would get called to a drug overdose death, I was getting to the scene and what I would find would be that the needle would still be in the arm or the needle would still be in the neck. And that person was coded. They were dead. So the reason for that is because they were used to take a certain amount of heroin, but now it's laced with fentanyl. And when they took that product, it was hitting their veins. And before they could remove the needle, their heart would stop as a result of the opioid that they were now taking. So this is where we're dealing with the majority of our drug overdose deaths. That was from opioids, not necessarily opiates. An opioid is a synthetic drug. It's manufactured, again, primarily overseas. If anybody's ever had an end of life patient, a loved one, and they're in there in the hospital and the doctors have prescribed pain management. Normally they'll give them a morphine drip. Well, when you consider that fentanyl is a hundred times stronger than morphine and right now about 50 times more potent than heroin. Again, that's where we're seeing most of our drug overdose deaths, but now it's even worse than that. We're dealing with something called car fentanyl. I'll get into it in a second here, but fentanyl comes in several forms. Pill form, powder form, liquid, patch, lollipop, nasal sprays, and lozenges. Primarily in the Northeast, we're dealing with pill form and we're dealing with powder form. There are patches that are prescribed by doctors and they're slow release because it's transdermal. So you can put it on your arm and it'll be a 72 hour patch. But primarily it's coming in pill and it's coming in powder form. We used to see more liquid form where somebody would come in and they would dip their cigarettes in the fentanyl and then they would just go outside and rip a butt. But what they were doing was actually ingesting fentanyl, but you couldn't smell it. So there was no real way of telling except for after the fact. So fentanyl can be smoked. It can be injected, snorted, again, transdermal patches or eaten. We live in a society here where when we deal with somebody that we don't know, and I usually do this you know, when I have a little bit more time here, but if I don't know somebody, I walk up to them and I shake their hand. Um, but if I know you, I don't shake your hand. So we've got to stop doing things that we've done for so long where I don't know you, so we should touch each other. So if you're downtown New York City or you're in Boston and somebody walks up to you and they just want to shake your hand for no reason at all, we've got to be of the mindset to tell them no. We're seeing more uh, uh, needle sticking where somebody's just walking up behind somebody and sticking them with a needle. This is true on college campuses a lot. Again, things to be aware of. But car fentanyl is big in the Northeast right now. It's 100 times stronger than fentanyl. So where we're seeing a lot of our drug overdose deaths, it's not from heroin anymore. It's from synthetic opioids being fentanyl and car fentanyl. So here are some handling guidelines. Don't. If you see something on the ground, stop touching it. Stop touching people. People are ingesting it. And again, I know that there are some credit unions locally where there was a uh, young um, worker uh, that had taken in some money that had some fentanyl on it or heroin that's on it. Again, these things are transdermal. Um, it can actually drop our employees with a very small amount of fentanyl. So money is dirty. More than, and this is an interesting stat. Again, I worked undercover narcotics. So if I could seize drugs and money together, then I could go to our state and I could say, or our feds, and I could say, because the money and the drugs are, are, are seized together, we're going to take all of the cash as proceeds for our undercover operations. So one day I took the money to the lab and I said, hey, just test this money for drugs because that's going to help me bolster my case. And she said, no. She, and she told me 94% of all cash will test positive for drugs. So primarily cocaine, but we're seeing more and more fentanyl, xylazine, um, crack, uh, crack cocaine, some of these things that are actually methamphetamine on our drugs now. Now, this is a nasty statistic for you, but more than 94% of cash test positive for staphylococcus. So fecal matter on our money. And the flu virus can live on money for up to 17 days. They've done this in controlled environments where they've tested that. So if your employees uh, have gloves um, or, you know, they take money in a large deposit, encourage them, wash your hands, make sure that you're getting this product off of your hands. Money is dirty. We all know that money's dirty. But again, having that conversation with your employees is critical. Now, one of the reasons why we don't have thousands of drug overdose deaths in every state all across the country is because of Narcan. So I strongly encourage you. I don't care what state you're in or how big or small your credit union is. I strongly encourage you to have Narcan or Naloxone on site at your credit union. And you can decide to use this for, for members or if, if you want to. But the reality of it is, is this is on site for your employees. Whenever we got to an unwitnessed um, somebody passing out or death, the first thing that we would do from a law enforcement or from an EMT perspective is administer Narcan. If it ended up being a heart attack, 
I don't care. I'm going to give them Narcan first. We're going to hope for the best. If it doesn't work, then we're going to start our chest compressions or whatever we have to do. But naloxone does not have a negative impact on somebody that's not overdosing. So the first thing that we would do is administer that Narcan. Very, very simple to do. It's just a nasal actuator. You put, it's four milligrams, two milligrams in one nose, two milligrams in the other nostril. And that's all that you have to do. I was down in Vicksburg, Mississippi the other day, teaching a group of cops. I had about a hundred cops in the room. And when I got to this slide, people rolled their eyes and they're like, you know, we just were empowering them just to do it again. And so I push back and I tell them the moment that you as a cop or an EMT or as an organization are not willing to put a nasal spray up somebody's nose to save their life is the moment that you hang it up. You're in the wrong line of work. If we're not willing to help somebody that needs help, then again, I think that we are failing as a society. I strongly encourage you to get this on site. The most expensive part of the Narcan kit is the bag that it comes in. You're talking about $8 and a lot of pharmacies locally, you can go in there and you can get it for free. So all you're doing is literally buying the kit. Put it with your AED. Put it with your first aid kit. Have it. Maybe you never knew, never use it, but I'd rather have it and not need it. The last slide that I'm going to get to today is methamphetamine. And again, I'm going to try to get through this quick. I've got four minutes here. So a lot of times people will think, well, I've seen the show Breaking Bad, so I understand methamphetamine. But the reality of it is, is that that's not how methamphetamine is made anymore. It is, but primarily what we're seeing is shake and bake or one pot meth. And this is really important. So we have Earth Day that's coming up, I believe, in a, in a week or so. So anybody that's ever done any uh, roadside cleanups or parking lot cleanups, this is really, really critical for you to understand. So here's how, how it's made. So you go to your local pharmacy and you buy a bottle. I don't know if you can see this with my virtual background or not, but you're going to take that bottle and you're going to buy all products that you can buy at Rite Aid. So you're going to buy your pseudofederin. You're going to buy ice packs. You rip open the ice pack. You drop the ice pack silicone gel balls inside of your bottle. Then you're going to take lithium batteries, unwrap a lithium battery and inside of a lithium battery is lithium. And you're going to put Coleman lighter fluid and all kinds of other things inside of this bottle. And then it's going to start rolling. It's going to start cooking. And as it's cooking, that bottle's building up pressure. And then you're going to have to burp it, they call it, right? Let the chemical out so that the bottle doesn't explode. Then you twist the cap back on and it starts rolling again and cooking inside of that bottle. Now, this is really, really important for you to understand. I'm going to show a video and then I'm going to explain why this is so critical. This is Tulsa, Oklahoma PD. And they're going to show you just how important it is or just how easy it is to make one pot meth or shake and bake meth. All right, so we all saw the explosion that happened on our screen there. Now, if for some reason you don't die as a result of the explosion that just happened in the bag at your leg, you will over a period of the next two weeks based on the chemicals that you just ingested coming out of that bottle. Now, here's why that's so important. If you're doing a roadside cleanup or a parking lot cleanup or Earth Day, maybe you've got your kids. Let's just uh, just give you a quick uh, story. So let's just say I'm working a patrol shift. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm driving down I-93 and I see a car with a tail light out. Unbeknownst to me as a patrol officer, the passenger in that car is cooking one pot meth. Now, these guys oftentimes are considered tweakers, right? So they're very paranoid about what's going on. So the passenger thinks that cop is pulling me over because I'm cooking one pot meth in a blue Powerade bottle. That's the way they think, right? So they take that bottle and they throw it out the window. Now, depending on how that bottle lies, maybe the lithium strips get caught in the cap of that bottle and it stops rolling. It stops cooking inside of that bottle until you're doing your Earth Day and you pick that bottle up and you drop it inside of your bag and it starts that rolling process again. It starts that cooking process inside the bottle. And that's the explosion that happens at your leg. There was a guy with a young child that was walking down I-35 in Austin, Texas, and he was doing Earth Day, exactly that. Picked up a bottle, dropped it inside of his bag. His, I think, nine-year-old was standing beside him as they were walking down I-35. That's the explosion that happened in his bag, and it killed his nine-year-old son because he had no idea what he was picking up. So, again, I strongly encourage you, if you see a bottle out there and it's, it's under pressure, or it's a different color liquid. I'm drinking out of a hint bottle. It's water. So if there's a brown liquid in here or a green liquid that's in here, don't pick that up. It's extremely important for you to understand those things. Again, this training today in a really short period of time, it's not intended to be scary, but rather bring to light some of the threats that we are facing as a society and that you're seeing as a credit union. And again, I promise you this. This drug epidemic, it is so large that every one of you that's on this call today knows somebody, and I promise you it is inside of your workplace today. Last thing I'm going to end with, these are good people. 
They have a horrible problem, but it is critical that your employees understand that all of these things are transdermal. Stop just picking up things that are on the ground. And if you do touch money that's got a white powder on it, be very cognizant of the fact that could be some sort of transdermal drug and it might drop you just that quickly. Again, high level overview of what these drugs look like. This is a much longer presentation. If you choose to engage with me, I encourage you to take a photo of the slide. I would love to have a conversation with you. My business travels around the country. I come to your credit union and I will do live training that you can record and you can have it for access for all of your employees throughout the year. Dean, Amy, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I'm 30 minutes on the nose and I will be quiet. <laughs> all right. Joe, thank you very much. Um, a lot of scary statistics in there. Um, but really good information that you shared. We appreciate uh, you taking the time this morning. And um, it looks like we have a upcoming training with you on May 21st. Uh, so if anyone is looking for information on that, please feel free to visit uh, ccway.org. Um, and there is a sign up on our, under our calendar of events. Um, if anyone has any questions that they would like us to pass along to Joe, we can certainly get them to you um, and then have Joe respond directly to you. Joe, again, thank you very much for your time this morning, and we are going to move on to Diane Gagne from New England Money. Diane joined New England Money Handler Systems in 2019 as a trainer, quickly advancing to installation technician within six months. In these roles, she trained TCR operators and performed installations supported by her colleagues in machine prep and rigging. Over time, her expertise expanded with the company's growth, leading to her transition to the sales team in 2021. As an account manager and product expert, Diane's background in restaurant management emphasizes the importance of prioritizing a great customer experience, a principle she applies diligently in her role, ensuring each customer receives a tailored solution that adds convenience, guidance, and value to their operations. Uh, please join me in welcoming Diane. The floor is yours. Thanks for that, Dean. Um, I'm going to just share my screen with all of you. Um, I saw some folks in the audience as Joe was talking um, that are familiar with our cash recyclers and, and our business in general, really, here at New England Money Handling Systems. The cash recycler uh, is the primary focus of what I want to talk about today. On the screen in front of you is my slide. I hope everybody can see that. There's a QR code. That's a link to my LinkedIn page. I share a lot of content focused around helping institutions, including credit unions, um, to better serve their members, better serve your customers, and really invest in solutions that make your business run really well and really attract more people for you because your success, frankly, is our success here at New England Money. We've been in business since 1976, so you know, approaching our 50 year anniversary. Uh, it's been a great run and we continue to grow. I think in uh, 2021 was our biggest growth year ever. We went from about 35 employees to 50 employees uh, to today in 2024. So uh, it was it was a really, it was a roller coaster for a little while. Uh, and I think cash recyclers had a big part of that because frankly, during that pandemic, if you had a cash recycler, I hope you were thankful for it because frankly, you know, when folks couldn't come to work or there was a, a chance that the branch couldn't open, those cash recyclers were able to sort of help with that, to have one less worry on your plate when you're running short staffed. And frankly, short staff is the, um, I'm gonna the screen real quick. Short staff is one of the biggest challenges that the credit unions face today. And again, all about improving member experience. So here's some challenges that we see, and there's uh, there's definitely more um, for the credit union space, but these are just some highlights that we see out there. Uh, we want your credit union to be profitable. We know rates are going crazy still. Um, right now they're sort of stabilized, but it's scaring some folks who would typically be, you know, searching for a house and want to get a mortgage. You know, now they're sort of stagnant and maybe choosing to rent out or extend a lease month to month right now. So we want to help you be profitable. And um, the cash recycler is going to save that time that the person has to wait who needs to talk to somebody, you know, rather than wait in a line or, or go face an ATM where there's not even a person. <clears throat> 
having the staff challenges, I think we can all understand that in any industry, not just credit unions. Also, the dual control piece of your business where two people need to go to a, a vault. We're going to take some money out, right? There's, a, there's that piece of it where we have limits. That's understandable where you can also set limits with the cash recycler. Um, so the cash recycler is eliminating that. We'll get more into that uh, very shortly. But the time, some, some of those locks, on the vaults, there's a timer on it, a 15 minute timer. So those people go set the lock. Now someone sort of has to be aware that that lock's gonna go off in 15 minutes and the two of them have to go back. And now we have to do a ticket and take the money and verify the money. It's a lot of time spent. The cash recycler is skipping all of that for the most part and this cash recycler acts as your dual control. The loss, the errors, the, the prevention of just making sure that we are not having issues in terms of at the end of the day, we're balancing our drawers, we're balancing the vault, we're auditing the vault and eliminating those errors virtually by having each teller have one total throughout the whole day rather than passing all these tickets all around the branch is much, much simpler than having this vault to vault transaction constantly throughout the day with multiple people. And then just making sure your staff has the time to focus on their members and meet their targets and goals that you would like them to have and, and then meet to, again, increase, increase profit, but also the member experience. <clears throat> this is one slide that I was sort of torn about. Uh, there's a part in uh, Infinity War. I don't know if I have any Avengers fans here, but uh, Black Panther does not want <laughs> the Hulk. He doesn't want Banner to bow to him. But I thought it was kind of an interesting way to talk about the credit unions out there, and may, none of them may be on this uh, call here, but when folks go, we know what happens because I've talked to some folks that work at some savings banks where credit unions actually send their members to cash a check because the credit union does not carry any cash. Those credit unions are sort of opening their members up to become a, a member or a customer of another institution by doing that. And we'd love to help save that person to be your make your institution their one and first institution for everything. <clears throat> and just the overall value, I'm not gonna go through each of these because my slides do it for you, but as you read through this or folks who are on the recorded issue, check out these uh, values because frankly, all of these are impacted when you bring on the cash recycler. Brief history, right, we have the ATMs, and I often see ATMs being compared to the cash recycler just because we're put, taking cash out and putting cash in the, the most basic part of the cash recycler. And that's really what ATMs are capable of too. But just going back to the history of 1969 when the first ATM was brought into the US and then the ATM cards, of course, that go in tandem with the ATM and the, the preliminary machine that came before the cash recycler was a cash dispenser. And you may be familiar with that because those have been around for 20 years plus. And instead of recycling cash, they're just dispensing the cash. So a teller comes in, they open the lock, they you know take out a, a predetermined amount of cash, it's already been verified. They put it in all the slots and then they can dial up the cash whenever they need to, which is, was a nice precursor to what we're doing today with cash recycling. Um, the biggest difference being now you can deposit cash into the recycler where you couldn't do that with the dispensers. You really just had to load it, take cash out as you need it. It was great on a Friday afternoon when you have all these folks coming into cash or check after 2.30, 3 o'clock, and you just need to dial up that cash. So we're keeping that alive with the recycler as well. Enhancing your security. We do have a UL rated vault on every cash recycler um, with a lock. Uh, the, the locks are custom to your institution's needs. Um, it has to have a deadbolt or a swing bolt, depending on the model cash recycler. And you also can arm it to your alarm panel, which is wonderful. Um, just another layer of security, which is the essence of, of what we're bringing you is uh, better security. <clears throat> a lot of the regulators love to see cash recyclers and build and see the institutions that are building policies around them. And we can help you with that as well in terms of you know, making sure your robbery um, procedure is part of that, having the cash recycler give out a predetermined amount in the event of a robbery, and then being able to look up those serial numbers, just like we have today with the bait or the, um, I mean, it's just bait cash, right, that we have in the drawer today. So you can also use the cash recycler for that purpose. 
it's got a built-in functionality that we can program into it. <clears throat> Just minimizing exposure in general, keeping those cash drawers, the physical cash drawers that we have today with almost no cash in them is a wonderful feeling when you have that cash recycler because the cash recycler is available for you to bring cash out and put cash in all day long and to verify. Counterfeit detection comes standard on all glory recyclers that we offer in terms of, I just talked about the serial number recording on the robbery dispense, but we're using contact image sensor technology to detect not only the paper and checking for the magnetic ink, but also grabbing those serial numbers because that is the latest technology in counterfeit detection is knowing those serial numbers and being able to read that on the cash recycler side is huge. And just having a cash recycler in general, I'm gonna to go to my next slide because uh, there's a important piece of it. When you have a sign up that basically says, tellers do not have direct access to cash, it really is helpful. All of our customers for the most part have given some interest into this. Some do it, some don't. Um, I think we all learned during the, I referenced the pandemic a lot just because I think I learned a lot of lessons during the pandemic. Uh, Joseph spoke about not touching. I'm a hugger. I'm a hugger and a, I'm a handshaker. So um, during the pandemic, I sort of learned that that was not really welcome anymore. Um, but for folks I know uh, that know me know that I'm a hugger. So, but anyway, the signs uh, during the pandemic, not, all, not everybody reads the signs, but having a sign that has this out there, any robber is going to go somewhere else. It, it, it looks difficult to rob this bank. They're going to just go to the bank down the street. They're going to go to the little convenience store down the street. The vape shops are all getting hit now. So make your institution, make your credit union as difficult to hit as you possibly can. And signage really does help with that. <clears throat> I want to go back to where I was. Improving the customer engagement, that's really what we're all about. Because we want, again, we want your members to be the most catered to without um, making them wait, without you know any of the things that they think is a hardship by going to your credit union, we want them to see as a convenience. So reducing those wait times, getting rid of manual counting, just increasing overall efficiency at the teller line um, is a big part of what we're doing here with the cash recyclers. And giving those tellers enough time to, to perform the answers to the questions that members are asking, to be able to focus on the procedures, to be able to focus on cross-training so they can learn more skills to help that member right away without having to have them go sit down and wait for a customer service rep is huge. So we want to give them that time and help you train them for that. <clears throat> Reducing the balancing time, the way we deploy the cash recyclers for the most part, we are having Tellers work out of the cash recycler all day for every check cash, for every deposit, for every cash shipment load, everything that they're doing with cash, we would like them to be using the recycler for that. And then on the opposite side, at the end of the day, they just have one total to focus on rather than have to check all these tickets throughout the day. You know, over here, over here to the vault, here, over here to the ATM. There's some that you can't get rid of, but frankly, if we can go right from ATM to the cash recycler, that's eliminating a lot of work on the back end for both your tellers, but also for your back end folks who are analyzing and doing a little forensics whenever there is an issue. Uh, and also help you with the cash forecasting, reducing the cash, uh, the courier transit costs, right? Just being able to have that extra space, extra storage in your branch for cash really is a nice investment. Instead of maybe ordering cash every two weeks, you can order cash every three weeks. Um, it's just nice to have that extra and setting these limits for each of your vaults, making sure that you're staying in regulatory rules. There's my sign again. Some cash recycler terms you may have heard out there, a driver device or driver integration or recycler integration. These all sort of reference being able to speak with your teller application. Um, we have yet to meet a teller application that we cannot integrate with, which is wonderful. Um, you need integration for your cash recycler. Otherwise, you just have a monster paperweight sitting on the floor that holds cash. So um, the integration piece is something we're very experienced with. We'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, and any questions that you have about that or just want to learn more in general, I would love to talk to you after this call. Another a couple of terms you might see, RSMs or rolled storage modules. Those are sort of the old technology of how cash recyclers held your money. 
the, what it is is like a VHS tape, that nylar tape that you would see in a cassette tape, the, the cassette tape spaghetti, same material. It's wrapped around metal rollers, and then the notes are all held in those rollers. So if there's something, an issue like power loss or the equipment goes into error and you just can't get that money out by dispensing it, typically we would want you to be able to open the safe and still have access to the cash if you need to. However, with a rolled storage module, you cannot get access to that cash. Anyone who has a rolled storage mo module machine knows what I'm talking about. I'm not going to name names, but there's companies out there that still sell them. Um, we prefer to stay away from that technology. It is old technology. And frankly, if your recycler is not working, you cannot do anything with that cash and you're just stuck in the water. So that phase cash recyclers are what we're used to. Um, at the bottom of this page, you can see there's a, a nice stack of, if you can't tell, it's a stack of bills stuck into a cassette. That is the preferred method. Not only does it crumple the cash, not crumple, but it pushes the cash together so you can store more cash inside but it also stores it neatly so you don't have as many errors or issues as you might have with the RSMs. And the biggest bonus is that if you are down, you can still access that cash with minimal worry in terms of just being able to service your folks coming to the branch. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about Armored Carrier, but that is a nice focus because frankly, you are spending money on a cash recycler system However, you are investing that money into a system that's going to save you money. So that return on investment is really a lot bigger than I think most people realize when you do bring in an ATM, uh, excuse me, the cash recycler. Um, the cash recyclers are also much more reliable in comparison to ATMs. Just in general, uh, they don't require as much service. A lot of troubleshooting that can happen with the cash recycler can be done over the phone, including balancing questions and really just general questions in any form to make yourself more efficient. So if anybody on this call does business with us and has a cash recycler and wants to learn more about how to use it to get the most efficiency out of it, I'd be happy to connect with you anytime, uh, myself or my team, anybody to help you get the most efficiency out of your investment. <clears throat> the greatest thing about the cash recycler is it's flexible. Um, I'm gonna show you a video I'm going to spotlight my other camera here just to show you. We have the newest cash recyclers. Is there a way I can spotlight myself here? Is this something that I have to have the, let me do it, get off the share screen for a moment. If everybody can see my other window, I have a video or I have a connection here with two cash recyclers. One is the DLR by Glory, um, let me mute myself. Pardon my technical difficulties. No, I guess I can't. Well, if you can see um, the Diane Gagney screen, I have two cash recyclers here. We have a lower seated one, which can be great for a CSR office. We can also do those customer facing, which is something some folks have been asking about for a long time, customer facing cash recycling. Uh, it's out there, it's working. Our customers seem to love it so far. Um, and then we also have the traditional cash recycler here, the taller model. Um, they both hold uh, similar amounts of cash. It's not like you're getting a huge bonus by getting the taller model. The taller model is just the more popular because a lot more branches are building these stand up stations rather than the sit down station um, at the pod or at the teller line. Um, but if you're doing a new branch design, we'd be happy to consult with you on how you would like to deploy your recycler. I'm gonna take that off because I think it's a little bit confusing having the two videos. Let's share one more, I have a couple more slides here and then we're gonna get into the fun stuff. So just to talk about being flexible, having flexible solutions, um, that's what I mean by the integration, the cash stores, the size of your machines. There's some choices here that we would be happy to help guide you with and show you what choices you have, frankly, um, in terms of if you're just replacing something older, that's what we're seeing a lot of right now. There's some older machines out there that really just are kind of on their last legs. 
that are ready to be uh, maybe replaced next year or in the next six months. But whatever you're looking for, we'd be happy to consult with you. We do not charge to consult. We do not charge to come on site and measure the space that you have. Um, we also do in-house demonstrations here at New England Money Handling. So if you'd like to come here, we welcome you. Our demo room is very comfortable. It's really warm today, actually, because of the sun coming in the windows. Um, we also do virtual demonstrations, which uh, we don't do slideshows on virtual demonstrations. It is 100% working with the cash recycler. <clears throat> the software I'm going to get to now. And then the support piece is the other most important piece of what you're looking at from a cash recycler perspective. You want to make sure the support can handle the entire system from the software on your PC or your workstation to the cabling and connections to the machine itself, and then obviously repair and a fast response. Those are all the things we pride ourselves on, having the best support for the equipment. And we only, we do a lot of diligence on the equipment that we do offer for sales purposes, not only because it's our name out there and our reputation and our customers that depend on this great equipment, but also for the serviceability of it, we can't be bringing on equipment that isn't serviceable. This is a slide that just has a whole bunch of installations. There's a whole, you can see the customer facing ones on the right hand side with the, uh, the desk. We actually had that desk custom made as well, but you don't always have to have a custom made desk. You can just have a little cutout made in the desk if you need to, or maybe don't even need to cut the cutout as the counter typically sits flush right behind the touch screen of the machine. There's a picture in the, in the left hand side uh, that actually is using the recycler as part of the counter. There is no counter over that recycler. We actually have a coin dispenser sitting on the back of the recycler and that's just fine. We can set that up for you. This is what I mean by flexible, all these different ways to deploy the cash recycler. And then my contact, again, my LinkedIn QR code, if you'd like to scan that. But um, again, we'd be happy to talk to you, anyone from my service and sales team, just to answer any questions you have whether they're preliminary or you're looking to upgrade or just looking to find a better software solution with what you have existing, we can help you with that from a recycler's perspective. It's really what we do. Let's get to some fun stuff. All right. Thank you very much, Diane. That was uh, great information that you shared today. Um, some new options for some of the credit unions that maybe are not uh, offering cash right now. If anyone has questions for Diane, please feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat and we can read them off uh, for you. So we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to think of their questions and ask. Diane, I, this is Christine from Vermont. I have a question. Do you have a lot of people now that are actually having those cash machines right at the MSC's, MSR's desk? Like from those pictures? Yes, yeah, good. Yeah. Do you want to go back to it? I can show you the slide again. Um, are you talking about the customer facing or are you talking about the... Yeah, the... The customer one, you know, like when you're sitting there, you open up a new account and then you've got the cash machines right there. And it's really fun. Yeah. So I'll full screen it for you too. Um, these ones on the right hand side. So they, what we have here, you have the chair, right? The person sitting in the chair, your CSR, MSR. And they're sort of having their conversation, having their coffee, all that good stuff um, as they chit chat and sort of set up the new account, whatever reason we need to have cash. Uh, maybe they're paying off a big loan and want to close an account, whatever that looks like. But um, having the cash recycler right there is more interactive. So that person sitting in the seat who's working um, in the branch can say, okay, I'm going to prompt you to put your money in the machine. It's going to, and the machine lights up. It's a pretty cool show. Um, and once that machine lights up, I'm going to have you put your money right on top. There's even a little picture on top of the cash recycler to show you which way to put the money, um, okay. which just like any cash machine, you just sort of put the money right on top and it sucks it in for you. And if it's going to give you money, it's going to come right out the uh, dispenser right underneath that top. Wow. Well, that's pretty interesting. It makes it nice and safe, you know, so then you just put the money there and it's, counted and does it and I assume it would say if it doesn't agree you can take your money back and all that yep if, yes you can reverse it back the beauty of why this was a, a concept is this branch was built uh it's a big branch but they didn't give the CSRs enough room in their offices so we sort of came up with the desk concept 
to uh, fit the recyclers. And the recyclers themselves are, I mean, they're good size, but they could fit into a small location. We needed about 76 inches of clearance there, which um, they had plenty of that, which is which is really nice. 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 Thank you. I don't Welcome. see any questions in the chat. If anyone have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask directly to Diane. Right. I guess we don't have any questions for you, Diane. <laughs> if anyone does think of any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or Christine, and we can get uh, the questions over to Diane, and Diane can contact you um, directly. Diane, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it. I think you shared a lot of great information, showed some new options that are available for folks, um, and uh, hopefully we'll be talking to you soon. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. And we'll